Right, so <clears throat> good evening, everybody, and welcome to this um, Wednesday Bible study, the Bible time here from the parish of St. Christopher. It's always a oppor uh, great opportunity to, to spend this time with you, although at this time could be a very difficult time coming on to Christmas, but um, it doesn't shift us away from having discussion about Holy Scripture, which I think is necessary for development, and especially as you prepare for, for the season. There's a lot of things in which we, could, we can discuss as we come down closer to Christmas, and I want to deal with two things quickly before I go into the scripture. So let us pray before I begin. In the name of the Father, name of the Son, name of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you praise and all glory for the wonderful things that you continue to do for us. In the midst of all things of this world, we still have the opportunity to gather differently and to hear your word. Continue to give me the strength that is needed, Lord, so that I can do your will. That my will will be representing you, who is the king of all the universe. I ask you to send your Holy Spirit among us, and that all that has to be done will be according to your will. And we ask this to Jesus Christ, O Lord. Amen. I want to to discuss something called perspective. <clears throat> As we look at in scriptures, it is very important for us to understand perspective. And um, because as you go along through the gospel, you will see readings popping up like last week, you will have seen dealing with the Sabbath. And I think I brought in to being the, the Lord's Prayer. And it's important to understand that the four gospels that were written were written from a perspective, from a direction. And it is important for us to understand the gospel because at the one time I had a discussion with a, with a gentleman from a different faith and he was saying that oh, the Bible seemed to be a book that have a lot of mistakes in it. And I was trying to wonder why he would say that sort of thing about the Bible. And uh, because he said there are a lot of contradictions, especially in the gospels. And by studying the Bible myself over the years, I get to realize if you look at it from the perspective, there can be no mistake. So it's like, if you ask maybe a, a couple of people from the parish to the fine father child, someone might, might, you might surprise you here. Uh, if you ask 20 people, you might get 20 different perspectives. Some perspective will, you'll get a negative side, you'll get a, a positive side. And if you go uh, to, the first and second book of Kings and the first and second book of Chronicles, you realize it speaks about kings, about the development of the kingship of Israel, but the Chronicles have a little more positive view on the rule of kings. We speak about kings in a more positive light because from the priest, from the Deuteronomy perspective, which is 
Kings, first Kings and second Kings, which is Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy um, community, and the Chronicles, which is more from the priestly uh, community, they had different perspective on the, uh, the rules of the kings. So in other words, it's simply like if a couple of people sit down and discuss the relationship that they have with Jesus, they encounter all the testimony with Jesus, you realize that many people see Jesus from a different perspective, encounter Jesus at a different level at a different time. All this to say, as we go through the scriptures, we're going to see some famous, um, familiar um, readings, but it's from John's perspective. Luke, where the, the Synoptic Gospel may have similar perspective because they, they are borrowed work, but it still come from a different perspective. I was looking at um, the genealogy in Matthew and the genealogy in Luke. One genealogy was focused on bringing the, gene, the line of, of, of Joseph, and one was um, bent on bringing the line of Mary, that is Luke, and it all because of perspective. And therefore the experience and the, and the audience with these persons, the writer of the gospels were aiming for, they got to, they had was to bring it up across in a way that would be palatable to the community in which they, they, they were um, relating the gospel to. And it's the same thing that we are doing here today as we read to the gospel of um, um, Matthew, uh, in John, sorry, we realize that it comes from the Johannai community perspective. And that is key for us to understand. The second point I want to bring up quickly, I don't think we could do all this chapter today because it's a pretty long chapter and different and solid parts. Um, understanding Anglicanism. Sorry for bringing in a little bit of history. I, I, I cannot do without saying a lot of history um, as we go along. And how important this season of Christmas is for us. And with that, we keep in mind something called the incarnation, which is the uni unity of humanity and humanity. And it's key for us as Anglicans to understand. Uh, the role player in the, um, the incarnation, which first of all is the Blessed Virgin Mary, who said yes to God. We all have heard that in our reading on Sunday from around the Gospel of Luke chapter one from verse 39 or so. And then we, when she said yes to God and that relationship with, with the confirmation by Elizabeth, the cousin, and of course her son, it tells us then how important Mary is to the church. And I feel one of these days we'll have to do a discussion some way out of maybe the Bible studies of how important Mary is to our church. We don't worship Mary as we would have mentioned in our Bible studies prior to this, uh, what we venerate her for, the work that she has done, respect the work and honor her uh, for saying yes. And one person asked me, well, you know, um, well, Father, but God could have chose anybody and say yes, it's true. But the fact is God chose Mary and it shows us that we have a right to respect Mary for the work that she has done. So this Christmas time, Christmas time, is a time high on Anglicans, um, agenda. It is a time in where we really and truly worship. I would try to encourage you all to find yourself in church and under these, the, the current circumstances, um, we may have to get online in that, so, in that way and support the services that is given around this time because this is actually the center of Anglican worship, Christmas, the incarnation, because it's where the theology of the incarnation is much more visible in comparison to the other part of the year. And therefore, let us get deep and treat our churches and our environment right. Our churches must continue to be light of the community. As I say in my own parish, I like my church to look beautiful around this time because it, it, it represents something, the light of the world <clears throat> who has come and who is still among us um, and lives in our hearts must be represented at least for Christmas time. So from my part here, I want to wish all of you who are here on Facebook, on YouTube, on, on Zoom, I'm very happy. Um, Christmas and make sure that we take the opportunity to pick gaps, perhaps the, the theology of the incarnation, how God united himself with, with humankind and become one of us to help us, to redeem us. So we continue in the Gospel of John chapter six and uh, it is a long chapter. I, I prepared up till, I prepared to do the whole thing, but um, I don't think it, 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 it is possible. And if, if it's God's will, we may be able to do it. But this is key for us to, to deal with it for what it is, as we look at it from the, the feeding of the 5,000 and so on, the 5,000 walk, walking on water, the bread of heaven, from the Gospel of John's perspective. For verse one to four, 
the crowd gathered to Jesus near the Sea of Galilee. And then from five to seven, Jesus asks Philip a question. After this, Jesus went on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his, with his disciples. Now, the Passover, the festival of the Jews, were there. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming towards him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered, six months wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to eat a little. So we are seeing here, Jesus looking at the crowd. The crowd following Jesus because he had something. Now we are discussing Jesus' work and the witness of Jesus, the signs in which he gave, the way that he preached, the way that he, he relates. And he had no, the people had no other choice but to want to follow Jesus, to know more. People live in their homes, this coming from distances, to hear food. And I mean spiritual food in that way. And now Jesus is about to engage Philip and his disciples in understanding the feeling of a few people. So from verses eight to nine, we see Andrew's help. So after Jesus asked Philip this question, and Philip responded that, you know, it'll take more than six months wages to just give everybody a little, then come Andrew. One of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among the people? In other words, it's seen as a very difficult task. It's seen as a very difficult task. And therefore, Andrew made it clear that it was, a, well, he made it clear that it would be a, a difficult task to share uh, these loaves and this, these fish. But from 10, 11 to 13, from 10 to 13, we see Jesus command the group to sit and the 5,000 were fed. And you will see the gathering of the fragments of the feast. So 10 to 13 says to us, Jesus said, make the people sit down. No, there was a great deal of grass in that place. So they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as many as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gather up, and from the fragments, a fish of five barley loaves, left by those who have eaten, they fill 12 baskets, a multiplication of gifts. Now, you could read into this and look at it from a perspective in where, in terms of giving, the investment in which we give from an individual. But I say again, I, I like to keep um, via the scriptures, not to kind of mix up what we do, because if we decide to preach a sermon on this, it will be a whole different, it's an expansion because you have to make the Bible relevant. How do we apply this even in modern time? But we are seeing here this great miracle by Jesus in which he, in, in himself, demonstrated to the disciples that all things are possible. And the feeding of the 5,000 certainly shows the disciples that putting your heart into things, in what you do, it could certainly bring great reward. So these five barley loaves and two fish was able to feed these 5,000 people. And it shows, it could link with um, the, the Psalm, Psalm 23, which my cup running over. In other words, the food running over. 
that it had remainers, 12 baskets or so. So from verse 14 to 17, or let me say from verse 14 to 21, no, verse 14 to 15, we see how the people react to the miracle from 14 to 15. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this indeed is the prophet. This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force, he made to make him king, he would do again in the mountain by himself. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he would do again to the mountain by himself. And we are seeing clearly here the intent of the people, you know, because by this miracle, they would have seen Jesus as the prophet predicted by Moses. And the people would have made an attempt uh, to make Jesus their earthly king. But Jesus understand that his kingship is not of this earth. So in many times when we look at the, the like when we go down to the crucifixion, down in that area there, and they would have asked, are you the king of the Jew? It would have been a, a, a real question because to some, Jesus was a king based on the science in which they themselves would have experienced. So they themselves would have been speaking about the science which he performed and the encounter that they had with Jesus. And that in itself would have provoked the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and perhaps the scribes um, to do what they did to Jesus later on, as we will see in the, in the gospel from chapter 18, going on to 19 and 20 and so on. Because the people experience was great. But Jesus understood that this cannot be part of his ministry. Exaltation, the time for exaltation um, was now. The time now was for, for humility. And therefore, he had was to separate himself from the earthly proclamation because the time of earthly proclamation had not yet come because he had work to complete. And hence the reason why Jesus isolated himself from the crowd that made an attempt to make him the earthly king. So yes, according to scriptures, in the gospel of, of John chapter six, there was an, an attempt to make Jesus an earthly king. Now from 16 to 21, we will see Jesus walk on water or the walking of water by Jesus. We see from 16 to 17, the disciples go out on the Sea of Galilee the wind disrupt the effort to cross the sea, rough waters. Jesus came to his disciples walking on the water and the common words of Jesus. And you know, I, I certainly like that in, in, in a sense, the common words of Jesus in the midst of the storm. And Jesus bring them to the destination. So this is from verses 16 to 17. And from verse 16 to 17, you see how much little subtopic come out there. The disciples go to the Sea of Galilee from 16 to 17. 18, the wind disrupt their effort to cross the sea. And 19, Jesus comes to his disciples walking on the water. From verse 20, we see the calming words of Jesus. And 21, uh, Jesus bring them to their destination. So let us read and see what it says here. When evening came, the disciples went down to Galilee got into a boat and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they heard roar about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, walking on the sea and coming near to the boat and they were terrified. But he said to them, if I, it is, sorry, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat reached the land towards which they were going. Now in this case, as you know, we would refer this Jesus walking on the water in the other gospels, I think the gospel, the gospel of Matthew. And you saw Peter going out. So now I'm telling you, the perspective is a slightly different. You would have heard Jesus walking on the water here, and Jesus walking on water in the Gospel of Matthew. But in this case, Jesus did not call out um, Peter to walk on the water in that sort of way. 
And this is why we are looking at perspective today when we look at this particular scriptures. All right. So we go along nicely. Actually, actually just see that can finish this evening. Jesus as the bread of life, and it starts from, from beginning at, uh, let me see, uh, verse 22 to 59. From verse 22 to 59, we will see Jesus, the bread of life. So from verse 22 to 24, we see the crowd followed, follows Jesus and his disciples. From verse 25 to 27, Jesus responds to the first question. Rabbi, when you come here, 28 to 29, Jesus answered the second question. 30 to 33, Jesus answered the third question. 34 to 40, Jesus answered the fourth request. Lord, give us this bread always. 41 to 46, we see Jesus explained why they rejected him. And 47 to 51, the true bread of heaven, or the true bread from heaven. And 52 to 59, receiving Jesus in the fullest sense. So let me bring it from the scripture's perspective here now, from verses 22 to 24, the crowd followed Jesus and his disciples to Caponium. The next day, the crowd that have stayed on the other side of the sea saw that they had been only, only one boat there. See that they, they were only one boat there. They also saw that Jesus had not, but into the boat with the disciples, but that his disciples have gone away alone. Then some boats from Tiberias came near to the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord has given thanks. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Caponium looking for Jesus. So we see that to 24. The crowd followed Jesus. So Jesus went to Caponium with his disciples, and you would have seen by him walking on the water from verses 16 to 21. And the crowd decided, well, they didn't see him coming back. And they followed Jesus to Caponium, or they went to Caponium looking for Jesus. From 25 to 27, Jesus responded to the first question. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? That's the first question. Jesus answered them, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of loaves. Do not work for food that perishes, but for food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father have set his seal. Well, Jesus is a funny fellow boy. The people ask that question, I don't know Jesus answered the people. Know. Jesus directed them to a different perspective, a different view of life. You are seeking answers. You are seeking, you're asking questions to satisfy yourself. You are seeking after Jesus to benefit yourself. But that doesn't matter. It's not about self-satisfaction, but it's one what the greater, the, the greater goal is to have that encounter um, with God the Father who sent him to do his work. And that's why Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, not because, but because you ate your fill of loaves. In other words, you're not looking from the, from the eyes or the, or the lens of spirituality. You are looking at it from a physical point of view. And therefore, you need you you are searching for a physical response. And this is one of the things in which the question that why the questions seem to be unanswered. You are looking for a physical response to, to satisfy your physical self. You don't understand the signs. You didn't come for the signs. You come because you get something to eat. In other words, in, in that sort of way. Okay. The second question. Jesus answered the second question from verses 28 to 29. Then they said to him, what must we do to perform the works of God? Second question, what must we do to perform the works of God?
All right, let me see. All right, 28, right? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Simple answer. He responded to this one directly. This is the work of God, that you believe in the one that he has sent. And this is one of the things that sometimes make it difficult sometimes to be a Christian itself. Because sometimes we, we put a lot of byproduct of, of being reasons to go to heaven or to have an encounter with Jesus. But all we are simply called to do is believe. And when we believe, then there are other characteristics that, that, that forms the byproduct in which leads us or reinforce, I should say, uh, the belief that we are called to have in that way. So I'm saying this to say that Jesus made it absolutely clear that this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Easy answer there. From 30 to 33, Jesus answered the third question. So we are going down to the third question now. So they said to him, what sign are you going to give us then so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Now, take into consideration, these people know it fully. They, feel like they, they talk about following Jesus because of the signs, but they continue to be persistent because they want more and more and more. And it could give us, um, it, could, it, could give, it, could, it could come from two ways. Either they're just hungry in terms of the fact that before Jesus coming into the world, or reaching to them, the lack of teaching and understanding were not available to them. And now that he began to show them signs and wonders, uh, they want more and more and more. Or we could see in our local parlance here, yeah, um, they were just hardened. But maybe that's not the case. All right? So they want more. They want to believe more. What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, as it was written. He gave them manna from heaven. And we'll go that, check that in Exodus, and we will see uh, when the people of Israel cross the Red Sea, God rained manna from the sky to feed them. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it was my Father who gave you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So this is redirecting from the physical bread. And this is what we were dealing with a little bit earlier in the, in the verses. Moving away from the physical bread, the bread in which we eat for satisfaction, to look at the, the spiritual bread in terms of the world in which we eat. And this is why I see it is important to understand as we look at the Gospel of John, Chapter one, it starts off by telling us the great intent. It did not, it, it wasn't like the other synoptic gospel. We kind of more or less give you a build up with gene, genealogy and story of Mary and all these other things and story of those sort of things. There. And then, then, then Mark came in with a kind of, kind of way like John, kind of way like them, kind of mix up. It made it absolutely clear who Jesus was in the beginning was the word and the word was God. So therefore, when all that Jesus is doing is drawing people to, to move away from seeing things. And we could go back to the Gospel of John chapter 3. You must be born from above. You need to see things from the lens of the spirit. And therefore, the physical things that you are seeing that is attracting you, the physical bread that you eat, is not sufficient to have an encounter with God. You need to encounter the spiritual aspect. And the true bread that comes down from heaven, that is what we're talking about, the incarnation. That's why I mentioned the incarnation there. The, the, that bread that came through the Blessed Virgin Mary. Now, it's not mentioned in the Gospel of John to see. It is in the other Gospel, at least the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke. Verses 34 to, to, to 40, Jesus answered the fourth question. Lord, give us this bread always. So we are seeing here, Jesus saying from verse 33, for the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and give life to the world. And they said to him in verse 34, Sir, give us this bread. This sounds familiar, right? This sounds familiar, like in the Gospel of John, chapter 4, when Samaritan woman, Sir, give me that water. 
So, so, so we're seeing these, these similarities going along this area here now. She seek for living water. And remember, Jesus was promoting living water. And Jesus is now promoting here the bread from heaven, the bread of heaven. So that's when we, when we, when we sing those nice little hymns for the communion. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. And the, 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 all those hymns that we sing for, for the sacrament, you know, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. And that's why you see we, we have to get it right the way that we view the sacrament here. Because if you decide to walk for physical bread, there's very little benefit, more than a taste of some little wafers and a little taste of wine. But if you go up for the spiritual bread, we are actually having that intimate relationship with Jesus at the point in time. And I remember, yes, the other day, you know, there was a lady that came by the office here now, and she, she was bedridden. And she told me one of these days she had to give a testimony of what had happened. She was bedridden for a long while. And one day I, I went by her, and she told me, for 30 years she hadn't taken the sacrament. And she was bedridden, flat, 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 flat. And the way all things were looking, it was, it seemed to many that it was, a, it was impossible for her to walk. And I went by her, she said, 30 years she hadn't taken the blessed sacrament. I said, so why didn't take the blessed sacrament? She said to me, well, she was confirmed and everything like that, but she was condemned because she had a child that went up along the area. Because I had 20 or 30 years. And the child could have been right, so about 30 years. And not married or all things. I said, do you believe in the sacrament? She said, yes, Father, I believe in the, in the sacrament. I said, now you, the condition in which you don't want to take the sacrament, I don't agree with that. I said, I believe that the sacrament must be taken with a clear conscience, with the intent that you intend to do right. And that is the key of the sacrament. Because the sacrament don't belong to the church. No. It belongs to God. It's, we say, we say, based on what the scriptures say, that it's the bread that comes down from heaven. We believe in transubstantiation and co-substantiation. We could go in all of the description the way that we look at the sacrament. But when the priest stands on the altar, and I think I believe that because most priests believe that, we are not representing ourselves. It has nothing to do with us. We understand that we are representing Jesus on his last supper when he gave his disciples um, the, the gift of the sacrament of bread and wine or body and blood. So we have no authority over who to give the sacrament. So sometimes I, I wonder, sometimes, you know, sometimes you see some of them people, sometimes they're lambasting, you know, say a lot of things there sometimes. But you lick sometimes, I just get sometimes with some people talking, they think it's easy. And sometimes they come up right here and you know, you know, and you had to put that bread in them. And you know, you tell yourself sometimes, this is not my will. This is God's will. And we continue to pray that this sacrament um, transform the hearts of some and bring them to that sense of consciousness. And that's what the church is built upon, was supposed to build upon. So I took it in my heart and I said, I'm going to give you the sacrament today. I come in the sacrament to say, thank you, Father, because nobody have given her the invitation. And you see, again, that when we lay claim to something that is not ours, priests before have not given her the invitation to share in the blessed sacrament. And I gave her the communion with great prayers. And it was a prayerful moment, short, but prayerful moment. And brothers and sisters, believe me when I tell you today, that woman is walking today, walking today. Now, I'm not saying I and I and I and I. I'm talking about the sacrament. That's why I'm promoting the sacrament, taking it with a right frame of mind. And sometimes when we deprive people because of what we feel we should deprive them for, when really and truly they are seeking to have that encounter with Jesus, we cannot starve people from the sacrament. I'm not saying that any and anybody should just walk up the street and take the sacrament and nothing that. I believe that. But I'm saying is we've got to teach people to look at the sacrament as one that comes from above. Yes, that's what the scripture is telling us today. More than just this physical bread and wine. Because as a little boy getting confirmed in St. Gregory's Anglican in the St. Stephen Parish, I see all these people used to be going on there and taking the little bread and little thing and taking the sip. And to me, that was my reason to get confirmed. I'm telling the truth. I'm making public confession. But then when I started to study and I get to understand the true nature of the sacrament of the Holy, Holy Communion, then I begin to take it differently, even consecrated. And that's why you see sometimes you can't, you, the preparation to, to do mass for me is a very serious thing for me. I've got to, I have to clear my mind from every dangers or 
pain that I face sometimes, even with even with the people within the church sometimes. And well, after that, I, I get some, some some bad sleep at night because it continues to trigger off and anxiety comes in and comes in and all these different things take place. But at the time of the altar, it is hard. It is one of the hardest tasks is to clear your mind or from the distraction of the world to make sure that when you consecrate this, that you are doing God's work and not mine. Because I tell you, if our people learn to have a proper encounter with the sacrament, miracles will happen. I have seen it for myself. The lady was here on Monday and she was reminding people, the few people that were around that there's a time that she never thought that she could have walked. And she took the sacrament and she began to improve. It so happened one time, I think it was around Lent. She decided to surprise me because she started to walk and I, I wasn't aware. So while we was doing this, I see this I, inside the church and I see this woman walking in. I said, but, but this is not the lady mine? And she started laughing, she said, you know what I mean? Well, that, that's before COVID, bro. She come and she hugged me up. She said, oh God, I come to surprise you today. And I was amazed to see God's work. And I, I, I tell people sometimes, God continue to work his purpose out. We just have to have the right frame of mind. And that woman on that day when she took the sacrament, it may be the very first encounter of first encounter that I've had as a, as a priest. Well, I ain't no priest long. January will make it only six years. But she was ready after 30 years of being condemned, 30 years of being disconnected, 30 years of people telling her she's not good enough, 30 years technically telling her, rejecting Jesus from her. And she got an invitation to share in the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And she did it with a clean hand and a pure heart. And I tell you the truth, she received her miracle. I asked her one of these years to give a testimony, to show, not, not to boast, but to show people that God continued to work in the community and God continued to work in our church. So verse 34 to 40 continues to show us that these people, 34 to 40, and I give you the, the direction which Jesus gave them for verse 33 or so, the one that comes from heaven. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. Okay? And that's where we get this song, I am the bread of life who comes to me shall not hunger. Here's where, this is the part of scripture that that, um, that, that um, song was written from. Whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. Just like any communion song. So the communion songs, and then when you see many of them, scripture. So it's not about deadness or how it's song or this type of music, but it's the meaning behind these things. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall never hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. All right? But I said, I, I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. In other words, how do you expect to encounter Jesus to, to get that fulfillment of the miracle when you don't believe? And I'll tell you about the story about the lady. She believed. She believed that she had this encounter with the blessed um, sacrament. She believed she is now reconciling with Jesus through the, blood, the body and blood in that way, sort of way. Everything that I, everything that the Father gives me will come to me. And anyone who comes to me, I will not drive away. And that's it. And, and, and I didn't know it was fitting in so nicely. That's what happened there. She came to Jesus, she called on Jesus and she decided to have that encounter with the blessed sacrament because at the time, she would have seen great value in receiving the sacrament. I think that may be one of the few high points in my, um, well, I have a few high points in ministry thus far, but that would have been certainly one, top 10 um, high points in my, in, my, in my ministry thus far. I've seen miracles, I'm telling you, I've seen it. I've seen reconciliation at the best, but I've also seen division. I've seen healing but I've also seen sickness. I've seen life, but I've also seen death. I've seen a church that seeks for peace, but I've seen a part of the church that seeks commerce. Wow, it's a dynamic world. But how do we continue to focus on Jesus and keep our eyes on what really matters? Some people keep their eyes on me, the priest, more than they keep their eye on Christ. If you continue to look at me, you're gonna see a sinful man, an imperfect man, 
a man who continues to do things that is not always pleasing to you, because many what is pleasing to God might be pleasing to you, and that is going to interrupt your spirituality. But if you journey with me as priests and keep your eyes on Jesus as I am keeping my eyes on Jesus, Lord, miracles will be part of your journey. I believe in that. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. And I will raise him up, I will raise him up, I will raise him up on the last day. Same song. I am the bread of life. You know that song. And you'll see it right here. So you see this song right here. So you can't say you didn't. And this is what this is this is why it likes to do scriptures. That is why it likes to read the Bible. You'll realize a lot of songs that we sing is biblical. No, I was doing a little a little topic on there's a song I call My God is awesome. He can move mountain. And, and in that valley song. Now that song mentioned my God is awesome like 70 times. No, a beautiful song. Nobody can debate that. But we chose to awesome, 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 repetition. Okay. But what about our hymns now that we have? As I don't mention, I am the bread of life. Come to be shall not hunger. Let me see if I can find it here for it. Which is actually biblical in nature. We throw away that because we tell ourselves that it doesn't sound like how we, I would like to, to hear it. And uh, like 595. And we miss, we miss the encounter what, what, what the scripture is telling us because by rejecting some of the hymns, some of the hymns, I should say, we are actually rejecting scripture because exactly, like for instance, when I look at uh, hymn number eight, 123, who are these like stars appearing? That's Revelation um, chapter seven from around verse nine and all kind of thing, verse 10 going along there. When, when John asks um, the one robe in white, who are these? Like stars up, who are these? We're in white robe, and they could see it woken out with, the, with that song of the saints. And it says here, I am the bread of life. They who come to me shall not hunger, they who believe in me shall not thirst. No one can come to me unless the Father draw him. I will raise him up, and I will raise him up, and I will raise him up on the last day. And this is exactly what you're saying here now. All right, from verse 40, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger. Whoever believes in me will never thirst. But I, but I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me. And anyone who comes to me, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. This is indeed the will of the Father, that all who see the Son and believe in him may have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Boom, we get a hymn there. Working nice. So you see how good it works for us when we when we read the scripture, and, and these are some certain things sometimes we overlook sometimes because we don't get into the scriptures. And now I hope that those of you who are here were able to see um, the connection with the hymns in which we sing and the true meaning of it, the one that comes from heaven, having that encounter from the bread that comes from heaven. So in other words, the physical bread in which it was looking at after they were fed, by, um, the 5,000 were fed, that was temporary, but the bread that comes from heaven is permanent. And that is what we are called to have an encounter with. So if we go to the, to the altar and we go for bread and wine, that's exactly what you're going to get. But if you go to the altar of God, and that's why I'm saying now, even in the time of the pandemic, I remind people, even in my parish, take an opportunity to take part in your sacrament if it's once a month. Do not take this thing for granted. This is the ultimate healer, you know, the encounter from above. Along with the COVID protocol, we're not, we're not executing, we're not excluding what the government says. But what we are saying, if you walk in a children in full, then don't go in, a, in, in, in that sort of way. But don't just stay away and say, me ain't going, me ain't going, me ain't going. That, that, that ain't making sense. The church, uh, from since the, the church, the church has space. 
Real recipes, you know, people, everybody in this I mean, come in and me and come in and I COVID and COVID and COVID. Find a time to come and take a blessing sample for me, please. Okay, so we go on to verses 41 to 46. Jesus explained why they rejected him. So we go here. Then the Jews began to complain about him because he said, I am the bread of life. So now we see another back and I'll come in, right? That comes from heaven. I'm the bread of life that comes from heaven. They were saying, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he say, I come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not complain among yourself. Do not complain among yourself. No one can come to me unless draws by the father who sent me. And I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets that they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who have heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone have seen the Father except the one who is from the Father. He has seen, he have seen the Father. So you see Jesus explain why he was rejected. Because if you're not, if you're not part of the thing, if, let me tell you something. If people are loyal to you, the Lord is bad, okay? You know, sometimes you call somebody a friend and they're close to you and all kind of things, so, but your eyes are turning your your white washer. If they're not your friend, they're not they're, they're not going to be loyal. And therefore, it is key for us to understand. Just as Jesus is saying here, if you don't be long term to me, if you don't accept me, how you want to how you want to accept that? That's the reason why you reject me anyway. That's the reason why people don't like you. Don't like people anymore you know, because they're just they're just just not loyal to them. They, they don't want no relationship with them. You cannot vex the people for disliking you because they will there will always be people who are going to like you, and there'll always be people who is going to dislike you. Don't expect everybody to like you. And it's, some, it's a harsh reality, even as a priest, because some people who sit close to you sometimes, is he very one with us? Do you get this? My God. And it's something that we have to learn. Otherwise, we can find ourselves in, the, in, in deep. And it's, it's a human thing. And Jesus is talking about it because they did Jesus that as well, as you can see here. Don't complain about yourself. If the Father don't draw you to me, then they can't come. I ain't expect you to support or believe I say. All right? But verse, first, verses 47 to 51, the true bread from heaven. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes have eternal life. I am the bread of heaven. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness and they die. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that, come, that, came, sorry, that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I give for you for that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. That's the soul. So you see him that we talk about. Is the flesh of the life of the world, right? And, and that sort of thing. All right? 51, right? The true bread. And 52 to 59 tells us about receiving Jesus in his fullness. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is the true food, and my blood is the true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like, the, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the Capernaum, in the, in the synagogue at Capernaum. So we are seeing here straight up receiving Jesus in his fullness, understanding who he is as an individual, the bread of heaven, the one who God sent to partake in his life, to integrate him or to reconcile with him because Jesus came, as we saw in chapter five and four, he came and he broke down the boundaries, the boundaries that divides us. So we move to, to, to reacting to the radical statement of Jesus. In, in this way, it seemed to be a very radical statement that Jesus made about the bread of life. And he was technically telling them for they accept it or they accept it, for they don't accept it or they don't accept it. And from 60 to 64, many disciples turned away. 
When many of the disciples heard it, they said, this teaching is difficult. Who can accept this? But Jesus being aware of this, that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is, it is the spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you, there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the, from the first who were the ones who did not believe and who was the one who would betray him. So the truth, truth is, if you don't, and it's a, same, it's a, fact, it's, it's a thing that we, we are facing within the society today. If we don't believe, it makes no sense. You make a hard task about it. Not everybody called to believe the same thing. And that's why we are talking about perspective. That's why I started off by talking about looking from things from the perspective, from perspectives. And we are called then to recognize, whereas this may be what I believe, the truth is, from your perspective, you may not believe that. And from my perspective, I may tell you about myself, and this is what I stand for. But from your perspective, you may see something different because you may have different thought. You may be able to see something different. You may interpret something differently. And therefore, based on the different perspective that we may have, it may cause us to disagree and we may not want to support each other in many things that we do. But in this case, we are called to, Jesus have respected people's perspective, understanding that from their perspective, they do not see him as the son of God. So I don't expect you to be my disciples. 65 to 66, the spiritual reason why many walk away. And this is what explains why they walk away. 65 to 66. And he said, and he said, for this reason, I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. Right? Simply by saying, for this reason, I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. And because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. Teaching was too hard. It requires a change of life. It requires a change of attitude. As we say, it requires a change of conversation. But some people are very comfortable in having negative conversation. You, you ever meet somebody that just can't talk something positive at all, that can't see a positive, can't look at something from a positive perspective, is always a negative kind of vibes and negative kind of talk? Have mercy, Lord. It have people like that existing. And therefore, if you try to change the conversation, they don't they, they, they do find you interesting to have a conversation with because the truth is on looking at things from a different perspective. Because you know, somebody could see, as I tell people sometimes, somebody could see you stand up, see the priest outside the room and they, they blame him for something else. Just talking and having a conversation and people interpret that to be something different because they're just not chosen to see differently. Some people will born blind, not physically blind, but spiritually blind. No, I shouldn't say that. That's a wrong statement. But I'm saying that some people chose to be blind. Let me put it that way, right? By choosing to, to, to see, to not to see things or see positive things, but more or less see uh, the negative things. Okay? 67, 69, the disciples stand as examples of willingness to follow, even if they don't understand all. So we see from 67 to 69, so Jesus asked the 12, do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One, the testimony of a few. Don't expect the masses. It's a testimony of a few. From verse 70 to 71, Jesus acknowledges or acknowledge of his own disciple. Jesus answered, did I not choose you, the 12? Yet one of you is a devil. He answered, speaking of Judas, uh, Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, for he, though one of the 12, was going to betray him. I think we did very well this evening to go through this whole chapter, and that is the end of chapter six in this case the end of chapter six of the Gospel of John. So let me look it over. 
We're talking about feeding of the 5,000, the preparation for the miracle. Uh, the crowd gathered to Jesus. Jesus asked Philip the question about the wages, and he, of course, he responded with the wages and so on. Then we talk about Andrew's help in terms of he found the guy with the, the five loaves and two fish, right? Then Jesus commanded the group to sit down. The 5,000 were fed, and they gathered um, 12 baskets of remaining food. And then the people begin to react to the miracle. Uh, Jesus, as the prophet predicted by Moses, so the people believe that he was the one prophet, uh, the one predicted by Moses to come, and the people attempt to make Jesus king or the earthly king, and Jesus went away from them. Then we go on to close, we, we go lower down from verses 16. Uh, Jesus walks on water, right? The disciple got into a boat um, on the Sea of Galilee. The wind disrupted their effort to cross the sea. Jesus came, Jesus, sorry, Jesus comes to his disciples walking on the water and the common words of Jesus. And Jesus bring them to the destination, which is over in Capernaum. Then from verse 22, we see Jesus begin to speak about being the bread of life. And the crowd followed Jesus and his disciples to Coponium. So you remember that they, they were looking for Jesus and to come back and they didn't find him. They jumped in the boat and they gone over in Coponium where Jesus most likely would have been. And then Jesus responded to the first question. They begin to ask Jesus a question. Rabbi, where did you come from? Then they asked him from verse 28 to 29. Jesus answered their second question. From 30 to 33, Jesus answered the third question. And 30, 34 to 40, Jesus answered a fourth request. Lord, give us that bread always. Then from 41 to 46, Jesus explained why they rejected him. And 47 to 51, the true bread from heaven, as we recently read. And 52 to 59, receiving Jesus in the fullest sense. And then the, the reaction of Jesus' radical statement in what they consider to be radical statement, from 60 to 64, many disciples were turned away. 65 to 66, the spiritual reason why many walk away. 67 to 69, the disciples stand as example of the willingness to follow even if they don't understand it. Well, that is Jesus' 12 disciples. And from 70 to 71, Jesus' knowledge of his own disciples. In other words, he knew all his disciples, even the one that was going to betray him. At this point in time, we will settle for some questions as we try to bring to clarification the Gospel of John chapter 6. Okay, we are reaching close at seven o'clock. And I certainly will have no problem with closing up here. So, but I want to make sure that person who have a question and you are sure to reach me when you're ready if there are any other questions. So before we close off, are there are any questions or areas for clarification? I do have one. I have one. Uh, that is really is more insight. Um, from your experience as a priest. What can we do? That's like um, the story in, in John chapter six, where Jesus, um, the, the people keep asking him for more, as you know, they had an insatiable need for more um, from Jesus. And similarly, in our day and age, our congregations ask or demand a lot from our priests. What can we do to make the life of our priests easier as congregation members? What can we do to make the life of our priests easier? Yes, sir. How can we assist with that? Well, you make a campaign here for, for, for my own benefit. All right. <laughs> yes. All right. Okay. Um, what, what, I, what I figure, though, is that um, 
people I don't understand that. First of all, we got to see a priest as a normal man or woman in our case. We feel pain just like everybody else. We get sad just like everybody else. We express emotions just like everybody else. We feel a sense of loss just like everybody else. Loneliness just like everybody else. We are encountering COVID-19 just like everybody else. We sometimes have anxiety disorder just like many other people because there's a mental disorder. And it's a question of people understanding to play their part. If I, if I as a priest have to make any request, is just for people to love the church, the building, the environment, just for to treat it as they treat their homes and make it worship, worship people. And there are certain things that I think a priest should not be dealing with and should not be getting involved in. Like for instance, now, I believe a priest should be getting finance, get involved in finance. What I think you should do is just oversee and the church manages its, its finance on its own. Members of the church, will, there were always people with groups on them. The various groups in the church, I feel the priest should not be having to deal with it, except if it does a retreat or a little Bible study session or all these different things, which is from the ecclesiastical or the pastoral side. I believe that the priest should have had to worry about cleaning the yard or cleaning the church or them kind of thing like that, or and that sort of thing. And I feel if we, and, and I believe that the priest should not be so much centered in the administration of the church per se. He, yes, he's the chairman of the vestry, but I think he should not be involved in that because involved in it as, as we have it now. Because I figure that it is tiresome, it is tiresome, and I think the pastoral aspect of the church, the, the, the take, it have, I have a lot of demands. I am of the opinion that the administrative arm of the church is finding difficulties in understanding the pastoral arm of the church. People see the priest on the Sunday or on a Wednesday service or so. And each congregation, like in my case, my congregation will see me on that day. But if you still walk in the footstep of a priest during the week, you will understand that this is certainly more than that. It is, it's a lot in that sort of way. But yet people, because people look at priests from the perspective of a pipe, so it's less, or a more co common statement, tunnel vision. So they put, look through the tunnel and so on, they see the priest so, and don't see all of that. People continue to make unreasonable demands. Unreasonable demands sometimes. And if you don't respond to some of the demands, is those are the demands that, that sometimes put you on the negative side of, of, of some people's tongue. Priests forget. Priests, priests have other things to do. Priests have to prioritize the way that they operate. Priests have to take time for lunch. A priest has to get breakfast. Perhaps he has to have dinner. He has to spend time with his family. And all these different things are necessary. But sometimes people see the priest as, let me call father, let me do this, let me do that. And that's why I try to allow my ministers to operate as from a pastoral perspective to understand that they have a role to play. And not that I shift any responsibility on them. But getting involved in it, if there's a, there's a case that is cannot handle it, really, really, certainly, really require the work of the priest, I think that is what you, you do. But sometimes there's a lot of things people could do for themselves. Like, for instance, now, somebody may come and tell you about a family issue or a family challenge that they may have. And all it requires is just to perhaps talk to someone. And perhaps the priest is the right one to talk to. But if I sit there, um, I have a group from the Mother's Union. I will call the chairman of the chairperson of the, of the Mother's Union to have that discussion with you. No, I want to talk to you, Father. And that could be, that, that, that's be very, very hard. It, it feels as though people depend on me too much. And I may have struggles in my life as, as well, because I do need to talk to somebody sometimes. As, as most priests know, we have our, our spiritual directors who we talk to. Um, we consult with our warden sometime within the church in, in, in the, the administrative matters and um, parish coordinator, like in this parish here. But, and then for spiritual matters, sometimes I, I call a, uh, well, I have a spiritual director 
And some of them I call what Bishop Bess is doing, and some of them I call when things are getting kind of overburdened. But we call on people too in that way. And, and therefore, it's a question of just sharing each other's responsibility, understanding that the priest is not only the person that you see, he has uh, sometimes, I, I believe that we have more, well, for personally me, I feel that priesthood is a very challenging thing. For me, as an individual, it's very, very difficult. Um, especially people don't understand what you do and what you continue to encounter. And the thing, and if, if, if there's one thing that I, will, I would say is, and which is kind of impossible, I'm asking for a, 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 a sort of impossible request, because it's not possible to be something nature and culture, is ease off of talking about the priest. You get facts right, because sometimes you see, sometimes you have to be dealing with things that, that I don't, you, you, you can imagine walking into a grocery, and as you, you decide that you don't want anything from a grocery, whatever given an experience, at the time I walk in the bathroom, I went in a route, I was going to buy a route, and my uncle went to buy a route. And I was already a priest. So I was muddy because we went to, we went, we went to plant cassava. So we decided we're hungry, you know, we, we pull up by this roti shop. As I reach in front of the roti shop in Barpo, the owner for the roti shop run and lock the gate. You know how I feel about it? And, and uh, you know, you had to see it to believe it. The lady saw me when she dropped out the jeep. She ran and she locked the gate as though I was a criminal. It feel, I feel, at least I feel that way. I tell she run alone. It was no walk, it was run. I didn't buy any roti that time. I better get full one time with gas, with, with anger, with disappointment, because when I grew up in Barapon, I would have encountered certain, certain, certain things. Um, so it's like that. How could you then defend something that you had no intention of doing or you didn't do? And sometimes, sometimes I find myself just um, defending a lot of things or, or focusing on some of things that I have no idea about. How could you then find a defense mechanism? So if I come by you and I tell you that um, there's a murder in Lafantin and you usually want to blame or anybody to blame me, and you were like, who's this person there? And you think I never even want a gun or see a gun in my life. How are you going to start to defend that? You can't. And sometimes I find that priests find themselves in situations sometimes, well, at least for me, Defending yourself from something that doesn't happen, that, that, that doesn't happen. There are things, things that has happened, people don't, don't talk about it. Things that is very visible, people don't talk about it. So, but allegations are, are things that, for me, is most destructive to a priest, at least to me, because it has caused me to have sleepless nights. And I always beg my parish sometimes, uh, not that it's bad, I like, you know, I'm bad talking about parish at all. Ease up on ease up. Man. When you hear people, when you hear people change the conversation, or just change it for a while. But if there's something that needs to be dealt with, come and talk to me. If Because if I'm the priest of the parish and somebody says something negative, that the priest is doing something that is that is not right, mm. the, the, the church structure is such a way that they could have that encounter with the priest. You could request, you could make a report to the, to the people's warden. The people's warden, depending on the nature of the case, will then call the rector's warden. And they will, they will request a meeting with the priest. And Father, this is what's happening. Is they are lacking in doing your work. You're not doing your work properly. You're, you're, you're untidy as a priest. You're... you're, you're they, we see here in, in, in a particular place, it alleged that they see in a particular place. That is the, that is the right of the church. But that has not come to the fore. Sometimes you'll hear things popping up here and popping up here. Popping up here and popping up here. Who could you deal with all of that though? Until one day I walk down the road, I see a guy, you say, you see Anglican priest? I say, yeah. He say, um, um, he say, everybody tell me I resemble the Anglican priest. I say, I hope you're behaving good enough. But I remember sitting on my office here, eh, one time when I fell say that, Father Charles looked like he just smoked weed. I said, what? No, let me tell you something. Eh? I grew up in a village with drugs. I have never put a cigarette in my mouth up to this day. Never put a cigarette in my mouth. Now, how am I going to defend somebody when they say that, 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 that they see that Father Charles smoking weed? You know, that kind of thing, you know, that kind of thing. Because I have a locks on my head, it means uh, that, that, that I smoke weed, you know, that, that sort of thing. I had also laugh, but. It, it, but then, understand this. That is something the church will gravitate to. I hear father talk smoking weed. Even the church people within the church, you know, forgive me. I hear father talk smoking weed. Only, only hear that, father talk. And that is what I want to run with. And for me, that is what, you know, you, you ever see the priest smoke a cigarette? You ever see, you, you, but you hear something going on the road. Somebody, but we want to choke a little, a little talk sometimes because he might look like a rastaday. 
apologize for being weird. And that, that would spread faster like, like, like wildfire allegations. And for me, that is, from a personal perspective, that is what hampers me the most. When I cannot defend something, well, I can't defend something that I don't know. So I think that, that's what I wish people stop making demands on in, in my part, demanding um, an unnecessary response when it's not required. People always have help. People always need help. And, and because sometimes the way that the ministry is, is visible, people start to demand more. The church for me in Sapphira is, 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 and not only the church alone, the environment, the, the community of, um, uh, of Sapphira, Mon Diablo and also, they know the priest. They, as I, my, I'm a unique priest. And we have done funerals for non-Anglicans. We have done services. Often just, week, just yesterday, I did a funeral for a young boy who, who's not even, who ne I never see the church. He, he used to go to the school and so on. I've been doing a funeral and thing again, sometime this week again for another person who not have been to the church. I've done that before. And it's because the church's mission have been a little more visible. Now, the people who the, 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 um, demand the work of the priest or the church doesn't understand what goes on or what the other things that the priests have to do. But the fact that the church is visible is a very good thing. So for that now, even though it can be tired summertimes, I, I take it as the church is, be, is, 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 is a little more visible within the community and the more visible the church becomes, it is more demand that the church uh, is, is upon the church. So I, um, I'm wrestling with that sort of way, that sort of demand and demand and demand. But the truth is, is that um, I think a cause that there's a self-inflicted um, demand because we have moved to promote the church and promote the church and promote the church. And the more you promote something, it's like you promote a brand, a shoe. And, and, the, the, and depending on your marketing strategy, is more people is going to ask for you. So it could be tired some, but it's something I have accepted because I'm very happy to know that people see the church as a place in which they could come to for help in any way. Any other question? Uh, just relaying um, Merry Christmas or Christmas greetings from Cynthia James on Facebook. Right. Okay. And thank you, Cynthia. And may God bless all of you for your Christmas as well. So if there's no other questions, I want to take this opportunity to thank all those on Facebook and uh, Zoom and on the other platform. I want to wish you a very Merry Christmas with your families and your friends. And remember, I spoke about the incarnation. Try and get involved in the Christmas service, you know, nine lessons and carols, and do all that you can to have that um, encounter with Jesus in preparation for the new year. We cannot go wrong with having a relationship with the bread of life. And of course, we open ourselves and our heart to receive the blessed sacrament of our Lord and that so that it could do great works within us. So I thank you again for sharing with us. We'll join next week as we continue on chapter seven. And next week we'll be dealing with the unbelief of Jesus' brother. Jesus at the festival of boots. Is this the Christ? Uh, officials are sent to arrest Jesus. River of living water, division among the people and unbelief of those in authority. So have a good night. Merry Christmas, everybody. And I will wish you happy new year next year, next next week, if God's been alive. Stay safe. Have a good evening.